Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it is perhaps painfully obvious to anyone who has turned on a television or listened to a radio program or even scrolled through Facebook on your computer that it is a presidential election year. There's no getting away from it. Everywhere you turn, there's another story about some candidates saying something outrageous and then another candidate's trying to be more outrageous than the last one as in their efforts to be elected to the highest office of the land. Why do they run? Why would anyone run? Why would anyone put them through the ordeal of running for the office of the president? Well, I suppose if you would ask them, they probably have fairly prepared answers for that, maybe even a little bit of a canned answer to tell you their reasonings. Maybe, maybe it's a, a, a statement that sounds rather noble or, or uh, provocative, like they are running to take back America, or they want to make the, the country great again, or something like that. But I think, I think the primary reason they do it the primary reason someone wants to have this most important of all offices, the basic reason has to do with power. They want power. They want power to use and exercise, and they would say they want that power to use it and exercise it for the good of the nation. And each candidate has an agenda as to what they say they will do with this power, once they have it. Now this is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's probably a good thing you know what people are planning on do should they be elected. Uh, one candidate has said that they will deport all illegal aliens who have come to this country, all 11 million of them. He's a little sketchy on the details, but hey, it's just an agenda, folks. Uh, others have said they want to keep out all the Muslims from coming into the country at least until Congress has got things figured out. Well, we know how long that will take. Uh, one candidate's agenda is to break up all the big banks and give universal health care and uh, tax all the wealthiest Americans. All these candidates have their own agendas, their plans of what they are going to do. Each of these agendas, though, all seem to be based on the premise of people's fears and needs for protection from sources uh, from within our country and from without. Well, every candidate has an agenda about how they will use power if they are elected. So it's probably a good idea to find out what their agenda is before you go and vote. Well, our Gospel reading for today from the Gospel of Luke, interestingly enough, also speaks about power. It says, then Jesus, filled by the power from the Holy Spirit, and according to Luke, Jesus does what he does and says what he says precisely because he is filled with the power, the great power, the power of the Spirit. Well, this is the first scene in the Gospel of Luke that offers us a, a description of Jesus' public ministry. And... And according to the, the way that the gospel writers think and operate, first things matter. First things matter because they set the tone and the priorities of the whole rest of the story. So it's clearly important to Luke for us to know that Jesus comes filled with power. And perhaps even more, it's important for us to know just what this kind of power looks like. You see, because... Jesus has an agenda, too. Which is, makes his choice of passages to read from Isaiah <clears throat> so very interesting, because his agenda has nothing at all to do with security for ourselves or speaking to our fears. No, Jesus has chosen to read from a portion of the prophet Isaiah, which seems to be seems to completely take issues of security and self-interest and fear off the agenda and focus our attention on the use of power upon those whom the world would rather not think about or even see. 
I would ask you to imagine for a moment Jesus' words. <clears throat> Jesus says he's not coming for the powerful of the world. He's coming to bring good news to the poor, to the captive, to the blind, and to the oppressed. These are the very people that most of us would rather not be. We would rather not be among the poor or the powerless or the outcast. These are the folks that you may pity, but you do not admire. And yet Jesus says he comes for them. Jesus, Luke begins by saying, comes with power of the Holy Spirit. And that power brings with it a whole other agenda entirely all of which challenges our typical notions of power. Power as the world usually understands it and as leaders exercise it has not always been good. John Acton, who was an English scholar and historian, wrote a letter to his bishop in 1887 and the bishop thought it was so worthy that he's forever quoted. Acton says, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. I think this reflects how people have often seen and understood power used and abused in our world. However power, at least the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that is of God, is demonstrated not by our accomplishments or our qualities that we may claim for ourselves, but it only is found in what it accomplishes for others. Power is only power when it sets others free, only when it builds others up, only when it is used for the betterment of others around us. How peculiar when you think of it and how different from the understanding of power that surrounds us. Indeed, the power of God at work in Jesus pushes us to shape, reshape our ideas about power and reorient our way of thinking away from ourselves and toward others. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit has been and continues to be at work in our world today. You know, you and I, we too have received the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think back to the last baptism you saw, or any baptism you saw for that matter. Whenever we watch the baptism of a little one at the, our font, the water is poured over their heads and the words are spoken, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are witnessing the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit that is poured over us like water poured upon the head of a new child of God. And so we too have received the power of the Holy Spirit in our baptisms. And it's through the power of this Holy Spirit that Christians have through the centuries done the things they've done and said the things they've said and because of that the church grew from 11 frightened men locked behind doors in Jerusalem on Good Friday into a movement that spans the entire globe and through the centuries. It empowered the terrified disciples to become bold. Peter and the others stood before the chief priests and the elders, the very same people that condemned Jesus to death, and they boldly proclaimed their faith that Jesus was the Messiah the savior of the world. It was the spirit who empowered the apostle Paul to go from town to town, from city to city, sharing and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. He endured punishments and beatings and imprisonment and all manner of trials and tribulations so that he might plant the first seeds of faith among Gentiles, non-Jews, that is people like us. From his efforts and through the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of thousands of others like him, the faith that we share in Jesus has spread from one tiny corner of this world to every corner of the world. However, this is not the only item on the Holy Spirit's agenda for Jesus' followers. No, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do much more than that. 
It empowered Christians in the 1800s in the United States to work for the end of slavery. They were called abolitionists because they wanted to abolish slavery in all its forms in the United States. And they, through their efforts of education and political activism, influenced the election of a president by the name of Abraham Lincoln. The Holy Spirit empowered an ordinary woman by the name of Dorothy Day. She was living in New York during the Great Depression to organize and to work to combat poverty by setting up soup kitchens in some of the first homeless shelters and work to fight against the causes of poverty. It empowered Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran pastor and professor, to speak out and work against the evils and injustices perpetrated by the Nazi government in his homeland. It empowered Martin Luther King Jr. to preach and organize against segregation and racism in the 1960s, which ultimately led to the Voting Rights Act and an end to formal government-sponsored segregation. The Holy Spirit has been empowering, that is, giving believers the power to make a difference in the world and in the lives of others. It's not a power as the world understands power, where one person is control over other people, making them do what is commanded or required by their laws and force or violence, no, it is a power that sees the needs of those that the world has chosen to ignore. It sees the needs of the poor and the hungry and the disabled and oppressed as Jesus did. It is a power that inspired, the belie inspired believers to move beyond mere charity, seeking a real change in unjust systems and institutions that seeks to change the hearts and minds of others so that they may be captured by the vision of Jesus' words and actions in the world. The Holy Spirit helps believers see the world as Jesus sees it and love the world as Jesus loves it. Jesus, filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, testifies to the fact that God's power is always seen as peculiar and odd and uncomfortable by the world because it focuses on those the world has overlooked or forgotten or discarded. He knows we act in ways that make it seem that some lives matter and others don't, but proclaims that those distinctions fade away in the face of the grace of God. That God sees all, God loves all, and intends for all to be redeemed. This day may we be open our hearts and minds and eyes to see and experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, that we too might live the Spirit's agenda, God's agenda for the world. Amen.